Hello, disruptive change makers. This is Lorna Lee, your host for Entrepreneurs for a Change, where we uncover what it takes to change the world through business and design life on your own terms. My very special guest for today is somebody I met at Mind Valley's Awesomeness Fest in Phuket, Thailand. This transformational event was a gathering of existing and aspiring entrepreneurs who want to make a difference in the world through bold, revolutionary, and innovative means. With me today is Chin Sin Chi, who is an internet marketer and technology entrepreneur. Her narrow escape from a kidnapping attempt prompted her to find an entrepreneurial solution for women's safety worldwide. Her solution was to co-create a mobile application called Watch Over Me, aimed at making women more secure while they're out alone. In this interview, Sin Chi shares how she managed to escape a kidnapping attempt in 2012 that occurred in broad daylight in a busy public space. Why lack of safety for women in public spaces is still such a problem in this day and age. How Watch Over Me app works to improve security for women when they're going about their business alone. Some of the mistakes she made in developing and launching her mobile application and what she'd do differently what she thinks is the most effective way to change the world, and how to make your life really matter. In her masterclass, which you can download for free at entrepreneursforachange.com slash 49, Sinji teaches us how to develop disruptive mobile technology solutions to address the world's most pressing concerns. In this masterclass, you will learn the step-by-step -step process of creating a mobile application that sells what user flow is, and why it's critical for the development of any mobile or web app. Her company's process for solving entrepreneurial roadblocks through A-B testing. The secret to getting more user downloads for your mobile application. How to raise venture capital for your disruptive technology company. Keys to identifying your soulmate investors and getting them to invest in your business. And so much more. Tools, people, and resources mentioned in the interview can be found in the show notes at entrepreneursforchange.com slash 49. Are you ready to be the change? If so, you've come to the right place. You're about to join a movement of entrepreneurs who are empowering people, saving the planet, and turning their passion into profits while creating the lifestyle of their dreams. If you don't believe us, check out our website at entrepreneursforchange.com a place where you can be inspired, mentored, and supported by a tribe of change-making entrepreneurs just like you. Now, before diving into the interview, I want to encourage you to rate, review, and download Entrepreneurs for a Change on iTunes. This really helps us reach more people with inspiring stories of entrepreneurs who are changing the world. Also, if these stories inspire you to start a world-changing business of your own, head over to our website at entrepreneursforachange.com and download the Business Changemakers Toolkit to get a jump start today. Now on to the show. So today we have a fantastic guest that I'm very excited to speak about because I met Sin Shi at Awesomeness Fest Phuket, which is the hub of really awesome people, change makers that are uh, doers, that are getting out there and uh, changing the world through their businesses. And uh, Sinchi is one of them. She is the co-founder of a personal safety app for women called Watch Over Me, uh, which I should absolutely install on my iPhone since I am a solo female traveler and I've been traveling this way for, gosh, like almost two decades. So it's long overdue. Um, but I should say that she started her career um, before starting this disruptive technology social enterprise. She started her career as an internet marketer at a personal growth company before branching out as a social media consultant for various brands and agencies. Now, what inspired her to start um, this amazing company and work with disruptive technology is um, a personal experience. Uh, in 2012, she escaped a kidnapping attempt and then decided to put her experience into good use by joining forces with her co-founder, James, to create the Watch Over Me app. So, Sinchi, please tell us, first of all, who you are and uh, what exactly does Watch Over Me do? Hi, um, so my name is Sinchi. I'm from Malaysia. I grew up in this uh, little island uh, north of the capital called Penang. And, um, well, just, just a little bit about my background. I majored in psychology, but I decided to venture into internet marketing upon graduating. And my, my first job ever was at Tower Records, selling music to strangers. And 
and like nobody sells music physical stores nowadays, right? But later on, like my first real job was at Mind Valley. It's an international personal growth company that uh, that sold personal growth products online using internet marketing. And there, when I was there, I managed and grew like a, um, a quarter million community of people really passionate and interested uh, in personal growth. And uh, when I was there at Mind Valley, I started tapping to a really serious powerhouse that was social media. And I spent the next couple of years riding the riding the social media wave in here in Malaysia. And that all kind of stopped short in 2012 when I escaped um, a pretty crazy kidnapping attempt. So I buckled down and set on my co-founder and decided to seriously focus on changing something that I personally felt was broken in this world, and that's women's safety. And that's how Watch Over Me was born. Uh, Watch Over Me operates on a very simple premise that um, firstly, it assumes that women, grown and adult women like Lauren and myself and like most people listening to this, don't want to be tracked all the time. Almost all of the existing safety apps out there in the market require your phone to be turned on all the time. Uh, it, they're more family tracking solutions. So if like you have a kid and you want to know where your 13 year old's going, you just insist the phone's turned on. But as an adult woman, Lauren, I'm sure you don't want to be tracked all the time by your parents or your boyfriend or whoever, right? Or the NSA, God, you know. Or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're all yeah, very all paranoid that. about getting tracked. I mean, I don't Big know, brother. like there's, there's good reason. Big brother. We don't want Big Brother tracking us either. Exactly. But at the same time, if something happens to you, wouldn't you want someone to know where you were? Like, totally. I, mean, I, I end up in random places all the time because that's part of the adventure of being a traveler. And often exactly. these adventures are completely spontaneous and they're really fun. But what if something yeah. happens? Nobody knows yeah, where I am. So, exactly. Exactly. So, so I'm operating on that first premise. And the second one was that a lot of the existing apps out in the market right now are panic button apps. But really, if you're running away from somebody, do you have time to unlock your phone, tap on like a, look for the app, turn on the app, and then hit a button? Like, God, I, it no. Was really, it was so <laughs> unlikely. I know. If I'm not pl- bludgeoning the person with my backpack with my phone in it, <laughs> then I'm <laughs> fleeing for my life. <laughs> exactly. It's fight or flight, not search for your app. You know? <laughs> That's what it is. So, um, so we thought like we wanted to make it as automatic as possible. So watch over me is very simple. If let's say, um, Lorna, if you're going to go for a run around Chiang Mai, like a 30 minute run, you would basically turn on the app and say 30 minutes. Um, watch over me for 30 minutes and just turn on your music, put the app in your pocket, uh, what, the phone in your pocket, whatever, and just go for your run. At like the 28th minute, it'll say, hey, is everything okay? And it'll keep pinging you repeatedly until like the 30th minute. And if after repeated alerts, like pings, you're, you still not, don't respond and say, hey, I'm safe or I need 10 more minutes, what it'll do is it'll send out an emergency alert to your emergency contact list that could be like your mom your dog your your dad your brother whatever whoever you choose right and then they would be able to see where you were at point a where you are right now and uh your location until your phone turns runs out battery or until you actually say i'm safe so um so that was that's one thing and for android phones we're also allowing users to be able to shake their phones to trigger an emergency alert so, for example, if um, you're holding your phone and you're walking to your car and someone grabs you, shaking your phone, even though your screen is locked, can help trigger an emergency alert. Automatically sends your location details and turns on your phone's camera to record whatever is going on and sends it to your emergency contact list. Hmm, that's very intriguing. Um, I, I can definitely see the value of being able to, you know, turn on the app um, when you are, let's say, going out of your safe zones, for example. I'm kind of curious, though, like, you know, being a spontaneous person, let's say I think I'm going to be out for 30 minutes and I mm-hmm. happen to be out for 45 minutes and I've mm-hmm. completely forgotten that my phone is in my backpack and stashed in my friend's bedroom someplace while we're all hanging out on the patio having a drink. Um, mm-hmm. so would that mean that for 15 minutes my emergency contacts are getting pinged? Yeah, that that actually would mean that. But which is why we we keep like um, putting an alarm like before. Let's say at the 28th minute, there's an alarm that goes out. 30 seconds later, another alarm. 
it just continues ringing until you actually say I'm safe. And then after 30 minutes, if it doesn't ring anymore, it just assumes that, okay, something's going on. So you turn it off. Mm -hmm. But the use case I've seen so far is um, most women use it while they're walking home from work. You get what I mean? Yes. Or totally. like mm -hmm. they're, and these things usually have a destination and have an end time. Or, or women typically use it when they feel slightly insecure about their safety. So let's say I'm walking home from work and like, and this alleyway is pretty damn dark. I turn this on and I hold on to it. I'm aware. Then when you turn it on, it automatically flips on your awareness switch. That's what I feel Watch Over Me does. Yeah, you know, I would say that this uh, one scenario is uh, is something that I've been in a lot that I'm always, so I could see certainly using Watch Over Me app doing. Every time I arrive in a new country and I have to take a taxi to my hotel or oh. my friend's destination and I'm arriving at night, sometimes you have no you know control over when the flights arrive in. So if I'm coming into, you know, Rio de Janeiro at nighttime, and I have to get oh, to yeah. my hostel across the city. Um, at that point, I would most certainly turn on Watch Over Me app. Or, you know, in a lot of places where, like, uh, there's frequent taxi crime where the taxis will, you know, steal, like, uh, steal your stuff, basically. You're, yeah. You could be mugged by your taxi driver. So It's the um, same thing here. Yeah, great. You know what I think would be a very cool add-on, too? Um, and this is something that I, I would totally use because there's some things that I always have on me. So if I had something like a tile app, you know, tile, those GPS oh, things. Yeah. So if I had a tile app that synced to, to watch over me app on my phone. So if my phone's in my purse and it's stashed someplace where I'm not hearing the alarm, but I had my little mm -hmm. tiny tile app attached to my belt. Um, mm -hmm. Then if it was going off, then I could I could imagine like, oh, like I could see that it's buzzing or being alerted or something. So, uh, so I, like, that could be a fix really for exciting. the separation of, you know, phone and person. So what's really exciting is that um, wearable technology is becoming so big today. And like in the next, like I personally think like three to five years, everyone will be wearing either a smartwatch or glasses, something relatively intelligent outside of just their phones and uh, what we're doing right now is instead of creating our own like tile tile like device or whatever is that we're looking to sync watch over me with um, any major existing devices like for example right now we're actually developing uh, like a watch over me companion app for Google Wear, so for the Moto 360 watches, the LG smart watches. So this way, if um, if you get a ping or whatever, it appears on your phone, and you can even extend the time on your phone, on, on your sorry, on your watch. Oh yeah, that's perfect. I was also going to say too, like oh, if it's not if not a tile app, then a watch. But yeah, yeah, absolutely, it's great if you have like some device that's on you that you can then you know like reset or something, so your friends aren't freaking out if uh, you're not. If they're getting emergency alerts for like 30 minutes while you're actually I know, having, a, having a cocktail next exactly. to a pool. <laughs> I mean, we were, we were thinking of developing a device on our own, but the reality of life is that everyone's just going to be carrying one thing. And that one thing had better be able to do everything from track your heartbeat to like, I don't know, like tracking your steps your fitness and why not safety as well right so uh i personally feel that that's the future of where it's going so we've decided to just integrate it with existing wearable technology that's so awesome i'm so glad you guys are doing this it's really much needed so i'm kind of curious you. about your kidnapping story and i know you've probably shared the story a lot i i saw that your your note on facebook got something in like the twenty thousand shares or likes or Ew. something like that That'd so crazy. do you mind sharing that story with us um again sure. okay no worries like that's what therapy is for <laughs> <laughs> okay so tell me what happened that fateful day well, um, it was it was like a Sunday afternoon. It's 5 p.m. I was in the neighborhood mall just buying really boring stuff. I wasn't even going out there shopping. I was just there to get printer uh, paper for my printer and ink and 
dinner. That's about it. You weren't and even I going was... to visit the adult sex toy shop. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Where you clearly would have been asking exactly for it, right? <laughs> exactly. Clearly. And I'm, I was wearing the daggiest things, right? I was wearing this, like, old cotton sundress I got for, like, $2. And, like, my old glasses, flip-flops. Like, nothing on me was particularly, I don't know. Sexy? Whoever was sexy <laughs> or you or ex. I think everything on me was like less than ten dollars, <laughs> but uh, so I was just walking to my car, and uh, when I opened the back door to put my stuff in, someone slammed the door against my back and held a knife to my neck. Well, initially I thought it was a really, really bad joke, right? Because you got one of those dumb friends sometimes to do shit like that. But after a while, I realized that none of my friends smell this bad, and I'm oh, pretty sure that oh, no. on my neck. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure what's up I can shut and uh, so this guy just popped out of nowhere and then they shoved me into the back of my own car and a second guy appeared and they got into the car and drove off with me in the car and I was like shit well, well I, trust me I said a lot worse words than that but uh, I was uh, as they were leaving the parking lot I was thinking to myself like okay if I don't get the hell out of here I'm screwed, like, probably literally, right? So I managed, as the car is leaving the car park, I managed to unlock the car door, and tr I attempt to jump out of the car. But the guy who was in the back seat with me pulled me back in. So for the next four to 500 meters, half my body was out the car, and the other half was still in the car. And we were fighting because I would just want to get the hell out of there, and they were holding me back. So at this point, I'm not really sure what happened. I punched someone, I kicked someone, I bit someone. I don't know, I had these bruises and all that. And eventually, I think they, they figured out it was just too much trouble and um, just let go. And I managed to roll out of the car as it was leaving the mall and run back inside. All this happened in like seven minutes, no more than seven minutes, according to the CCTV footage later. But it, uh, it kind of felt a lot longer than that. Wow. Do you think they were watching for you? I mean, did they, did, do you think they singled you out or they were just wa watching for somebody, a woman in the parking lot who looked like an easy target? Or do you think they were like stalking you per se? Well, I mean, that, that the biggest the first thing everyone wanted to find out is whether or not I was spotted from like, they followed me for ages. Because if, if it was something like, if they followed me, then we would still have had to be careful even after the whole incident. So when we reviewed all the tapes, um, it looked like I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. These two guys were just walking pretty aimlessly. And um, I happened to be there struggling with my I don't know, my bags of A4 paper and <laughs> crap. And I just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Does this happen frequently in Malaysia? I don't really hear of this. Like, I hear of kidnappings in other parts of the world, a lot more like Mexico or Brazil, but I, I never really thought of Malaysia as being a kidnapping hub. Well, the more common crime in Malaysia are snatch thefts, like these guys on scooters running, uh, driving by you and snatching your bag. That's probably the most common crime in Malaysia. Um, but what was interesting about what happened to me was that uh, I happened to be the first attack in a whole string of attacks in different malls in the Klang Valley. It lasted for about three months and there were maybe like there was maybe like an attack on a girl every week at every major mall in the Klang Valley. And that was really surprising. Uh, but it stopped for now. And what what I noticed is that because of the spate of attacks, all the malls seem to have upgraded their security and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's a good thing. But no, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider it very common. I mean, I've been to that mall so many times like I've left there at like 4 a.m., gone in like before it's opened. And it was, I most people find it like one of the safest car parks, mall car parks in, in the area. But so that was a huge surprise, not just to me, but to everyone else. Hmm. So I can imagine when you started from the point where this incident happened to the point where you started your company, you, you, you co-founded your company, I imagine you probably... Um, in your research, 
discovered a lot about violent crime against women, uh, not only in Malaysia, but in, you know, globally, because it's really a global pandemic, I think. And I'm kind of curious to know, like, you know, what have you learned in this process? Like, why is there such a problem around violent crime against women in this day and age, especially? So after, after I escaped my kidnapping attempt, I wrote this Facebook note that uh, inadvertently got like 50 over a thousand shares. And um, because of that, I had people, women writing to me from all over the world telling me that they've been through similar experiences or some of them were even worse, right? There was this one woman from Spain who wrote me to tell me that um, she was attacked as she was leaving her office and bundled into the trunk of someone's car and then she was raped she was gone for three days and she finally escaped and i'm like whoa what the fuck is that you know and i realized how common it is and recently there was this campaign called uh yes all women or each every woman to it, it basically um the whole premise of that campaign is that every woman in the world would experience being harassed at least once in their lifetime yeah, and, I mean, it's so normal. Like, you just have to, it's horrible. But, like, I had to grow up to ignore it. I mean, yes. it, it almost kind of, like, you know, became such a part of my reality that, you know, but but that's just wrong. You know, like, you have to ignore something that's clearly a violation of your personal space. Exactly. I read this article um, a couple months ago. It was written by the husband of a, of a victim of rape. In 2012, a woman in Australia was raped, as, uh, raped and murdered as she was coming, walking back home after work. And um, her husband wrote like um, a beautiful opinion piece on one of the Australian uh, newspapers that basically says that we live in a society that does not condemn misogyny at all. Like, uh, we listen to music that allows for rape jokes. We, when someone puts you on, on the street, we uh, like yells at you from the street, like, hey, you know, pretty lady or whatever. We're expected to think it's normal. Men don't yell at other men and tell them it's wrong to do that. You know, so we were living in a, we're living in a society that does not give any negative feedback to these people. In fact, like, it's not even a crime to harass someone on the street. The, the thing is, harassment is just like on a minor scale in the same spectrum of rape. If you get what I mean, where I'm going with this, it, it exists on the same spectrum. It's just not as serious. The severity level of severity is just not as high. So what, what are we doing here? We're, we're just we're allowing, we're creating the environment to allow for more and more misogyny. And we're, it's, just, it's just really frustrating. And the truth is, I don't know what we can do about it other than call out our own friends uh, like who are making jokes, misogynist jokes, who make jokes about other women uh, at a bar or whatever. That, that's the only thing we can do is that we, that we just have to call them out. No one's calling them out. Yeah, I had this moment where I was at some kind of tech networking event and I'm sitting down at a, a table with, you know, some folks and this young guy slides up to us and sits down. He's like, I grabbed like five butts in this uh, bar and I looked at him. I was like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> and he like I looked know. at me with like a deer, like caught in the headlights of a, of a, you know, uh, of a car. Like, why would I even say such a thing? But I'm like, why would you even do such a thing and then brag about it to your friend? I mean, what is wrong with you? You, you know, but yeah. then it doesn't really occur to the person that there's something really wrong with that. And what what I learned about the uh, from the Yes All Women campaign that kind of went viral on on Twitter was the fact that you know why is it that we teach our daughters oh don't go out and get you know dressed up like that you're asking for trouble uh, when we don't teach our sons don't rape. So we teach exactly. our girls, don't wear a short skirt because you're asking to be raped, but we don't tell our sons r raping is, is bad and you really shouldn't do it. Yes, exactly. I wanted to just read out a part of the article that I personally felt resonated with me, like, a lot. I read this twice, and, like, I, I admit I cried when I read it because I felt so strongly about it. And... He said, men need to break their silence on the root societal causes of men's violence against women, rather than perpetuate a monster myth that merely places blame upon evil individuals. Like when, and that's so true, because 
someone like a criminal, a guy who rapes, who could rape you, could be just the guy walking next to you on the street. He doesn't have to be a psychopath. So we see in male peer groups where rape jokes and disrespectful attitudes towards women go uncontested. And the monster myth creates an illusion that this is simply banter and it's simply a joke. But no, it's sexist horseplay. This was written by um, the husband of this woman, Jill Meager, who was raped and murdered on her way home in Melbourne. Mm. Yeah, it's so tragic. And I would, I would love to see violent crime against women as a statistic falling rather than rising. You've shared with me a lot of the stories that came out um, and were shared with you about you know, similar experiences about being kidnapped and uh, raped and assaulted and, and things like that. Do you have any stories from users of Watch Over Me app? you know, where, where the app really helped them. Someone left a review on our app store last year to say that, you know, thank you for making this app because I was walking home one night and a, a guy came up to me with a knife and yelled, give me all your stuff. So I shook my phone. We, I told you we have this feature called the, the shake to trigger an emergency where you can just shake your phone. So I shook my phone and it turned on like the alarm and turned on the camera with the light and it just yelled, my my mom now, the police have your face, everyone knows who you are, and he ran away. So thank you. Oh my that, god, yes. <laughs> that was the she left on the app store. And I, I mean, I would have missed it, because usually you don't, you don't hear the good stories, you know? And so I was really grateful. I've been trying to reach out to this woman, but I haven't been able to find her. So if you're listening to this, like, I'm really grateful I read that review. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that probably for every person that takes the extra step to uh, make a positive review or to actually you know, share their story, there's you know dozens more people where the app has been really helpful to them, but they just hadn't you know taken that extra step to you know get onto iTunes and say something or reach out to your company. But you know, just one person's safety is enough, in my opinion. Exactly. Like for me, that that made me feel really good, and um, a couple. A couple weeks ago, I'm not sure how long ago, but we got uh, we got a review we review from this woman who was who went for a run and she fell into a ditch. She couldn't get to her phone, but uh, her time went up. So she was using the usual feature, the one where it counts down. And uh, her husband came looking for her because she never made it home, and he used the map to locate her and got her from the ditch. <laughs> So that was really, really nice. No one attacked her, but um, she she just fell, and at least that was helpful. Or she would have been there until someone came to look for her. You know. Wow. Yeah. That that's so great. Yeah. That that's that's a great story too. I mean, yeah. You, you don't know. I mean, it's anything can happen to you. Like I, I think sometimes we forget how precarious our safety might be. And um, exactly. Yeah. And it just takes one incident where you realize, oh, my God, if I don't have the appropriate safety net network in place, nobody might know <laughs> what's what's happening to me. There's nobody that could help me. So uh, so it's really great that, you know, that we have uh, this tool on the market. Um, what? I'm, so I'm, I can't wait to dive more into your master class where you're going to um, go into the process of how you exactly were able to create a technology solution to a uh, major problem. But I do want to touch upon um, your entrepreneurial journey around finding or, or, or developing a solution. So what was the moment where you realized from this experience that you needed to go ahead and, and come up with a tangible solution? And then, and then if you could explain you know, how, how long that process was, um, for you as well. And we'll get into the nitty gritty details of exactly how to do it step by step in your masterclass. But I'd love to just kind of like bridge that gap between experience and entrepreneurial inspiration. Sure. Um, well, honestly, I took a sabbatical after the whole attack. Um, I canceled all my freelance and consulting projects and I kind of just hold up somewhere just getting to know myself again right and finding my equilibrium and a couple months after that I was I was hanging out with a friend of mine his name is Wuhan and uh, I was telling Wuhan how like it's ridiculous that we depend on our phones or in technology for so many things in our life from fitness to like remembering that where where our next appointments are to navigating but technology there in terms of safety, uh, technology hasn't really broken through 
that whole area yet. And he was like, you know, maybe you could do something about it. You should go, you should go meet that guy, you know, James, who turned out later my co-founder and see what you can do about it. So James, my co-founder, he had in his spare time created what, what is now the, what was back then the bare bones technology of what watch over me is today. His story was, he, he lost contact with his sister for about three days. And uh, just as his parents were about to fly out to Australia to go look for her, his sister called. It turned out she was in a car accident and uh, was unconscious. So she couldn't uh, alert anyone. She was, she was driven to a hospital, but nobody knew who she was. Her housemates didn't know where she was. So uh, she just couldn't find a way to reach her family. And uh, so he built the bare bones technology to what Watch Over Me is today, except that um, he didn't really know what to do with it. So when, we, so when we sat down and got together and talked about it, I realized that um, I'm, I can't code, right? Like, I don't understand code at all. But what I can do is I can, I can do marketing. And what I can do is I can figure out good branding for, for whatever product. So I was like, okay, let's work together and let's just put this out. Put this out as watch over me and see how it does, right? And uh, we got like 150,000 users then after a year on the market. And midway through last year, we buckled down and said, you know what, let's double down on this. Clearly, a lot of people want this. Clearly, it's solving some people's problems. So let's figure out a way to make this even bigger and even better. And then we raised funds. So the truth is there's no like there was no cut and dry like, um, oh, my God, I'm going to build this product from scratch because because this incident like woke me up it was more like, let's, let's put this out there and see how it does and then like oh wow not bad let's double down should we double down or should we not double down every i feel like at every um every challenge we face uh every hurdle there's always the question whether or not we want to double down on this and um oh, what i do feel like double down what do you mean? like basically saying, okay let's um all right no this is getting hard you know let's you know what let's let's move forward or like give up. I think any entrepreneur faces that at every step of the way. And entrepreneurship to me is just pushing forward every time you face that, face yeah. that difficulty, whatever. That's a tricky one because I've also found too, it's, it's, a, it's a very precarious and delicate balance between knowing when to persevere and knowing when to fail quickly. <laughs> it's true it is but I feel like if you really really believe in something and uh if you've got like the expertise or you if you've got I wouldn't say the expertise or experience even if you've got the team for it then you just keep pushing forward until you find a combination that works sometimes that's just really it and for us like um watch Rumi as its current iteration uh has been great but Earlier this year, um, I was in San Francisco attending a class, and when I and when I realized that uh, women only use our app periodically, and when do they use our app when they don't feel safe, as I mentioned earlier, and then it made me wonder when don't women feel safe? Uh, so asking around, realized oh you know the streets a little bit dark. Oh I heard my my friend said someone got mugged here, or I know someone who got mugged here, or I read in the paper someone got mugged here. But all this like doesn't give you um, that. That's not the accurate picture of the place is secure. So this year, what we're what we're doing with Watch Over Me is that we're also integrating uh, crime data into the app, so that Watch Over Me can tell you whether or not the street you're on is safe or not. Like we we've been so the entire journey. The entire journey is just. It's just like little changes and little improvisations on the way. And this year, what, what we're evolving to, into is that we're, is we're moving away from being just an app, but being like a full-fledged safety service. I think that's huge, especially integrating the um, uh, neighborhood data, because I know from being in Rio de Janeiro that there were some blocks within my neighborhood where you simply could not be out after dark. It could be 6 p.m., but it was dark, and you really needed to not be on that two-block stretch of you know, the street 
in that neighborhood where just around the corner it was fine. So exactly. you don't know that if you're a tourist. You don't know that if you're a visitor or, or not from there or just moving into town. Or, or sometimes well, but, you don't even know if you have to, you know, you might find yourself in a situation where you're like, oh, I'm in this part of town and I have to walk over to get to this other part of town. And uh, Exactly. And yeah. sometimes it's not even about that. Sometimes, like, we, are, we're, we aren't too aware in every city. Because by the time the police say that, hey, this place is dangerous, like, maybe 20 people got mugged already. But can you stop it at the second person, the third person? These things usually happen in patterns, you know? So can we, can we figure that out before it happens? Before 50 people get mugged and the police say, okay, it's dangerous, stay away. So for us, that's what we're hoping to do. And at the same time, there are so many people who don't report muggings or molestations. Why? Because they don't want to go through the hassle of going to the police station. If, and if you're in Asia, nobody really trusts the police anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so, um, but what do people do? People post them on Twitter or Facebook. They say, oh, you know, my God, I got my bag snatched today. Or um, I was robbed today uh, on the corner of 4th and 5th Street or something like that, you know? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to compile official crime data and cross-reference it with social crime data to be able to say, to 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 hopefully be able to paint a more accurate picture of uh, whether a street is safe or not. Uh, Put it very simply, what we want to do is to basically add a safety rating to streets in cities that's about it i love that approach it reminds me of a uh, um, a crowd sourcing um platform called ushahidi which um uh, is used for crisis mapping so it's really cool it integrates with google maps and it allows users to upload data using twitter or their mobile phones um, around a number of different topics so it's been used to um map political violence in um yes i think it was in nigeria or some other african country um, it's also uh, you know used for like yeah crime as well so i, I think it's fantastic this idea of crowdsourcing data, but then also being able to cross-reference it with official sources. I think those two, those two features uh, would make it really strong, would make the information really strong. Exactly. And I mean, for no one really has done it very well for crime yet. And certainly not in the aspect of safety. You've got people who map this data and then sell it back to the police. But what about what about the average user? What about the average woman on the street? I would like to know if the street I'm living on are like two streets down, the, the way I walk to work every day, I'd like to know if some, like, two women got mugged on this route. I really would. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like, but rarely does it ever feed that back to the average user. So that's what we, that's what we really want to do. Fantastic. And, it sounds yeah. revolutionary. I think it's very, it's much needed. Um, so, hey, I just want to let you know that we're also coming close to the end of this segment uh, before we hop into the master class where you're going to share with us the uh, uh, step-by-step nitty-gritty of what it takes to build a, a disruptive social app that addresses a very important problem, human problem. Um, but before we hop into that, I'd like to wrap up with my last uh, favorite questions. Um, first sure. is, um, in your entrepreneurial journey, in the evolution of Watch Over Me app, for example, was there anything that you would do differently if you had the chance? Well, that's a good question. I don't like to think about, oh, you know, I wish I could change that. But you raise a... But if I could change something, I think um, I think it would be iterating really quickly. Like, I feel like it took us... It took me six to eight months to realize that, you know what, we need to do just more than just a safety app. Uh, I wish I came to that realization a lot quicker, but, and the, and how I would have come to that realization a lot quicker is basically immersing myself in a lot more learning. And, uh, I sometimes take for granted how much learning I need to do as an entrepreneur, because, um, 
you're tasked with basically learning just about everything. Like previously, I was a specialist. I specialized in user experience, marketing, and social and like marketing strategy. And suddenly, I had to learn legal. I had to learn finance. I had to learn just about everything. And I was getting so overwhelmed that I just said, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do and not bother to read up on anything and not bother to learn and not bother to integrate myself with learning. But how the whole safety rating idea came out was when I sat, I sat my head down in a, in a class in San Francisco. It was a one-day course on building a behavioral design product, like a behavior, sorry, on a behavioral design. How do you build a habit-forming product? And during that class, I basically said, oh, asked myself enough questions to come up with the realizations I have today. And that's how, we, that's how the direction of Watch Over Me has changed. And if I had put myself in the position with, and the openness to learn more, faster, a lot earlier, I think, I think by now we would have, like, we'd be so much more ahead of the game. But hey, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? It is all a learning journey, especially if you're an entrepreneur. There's cer certainly no end to the things that you can learn. Um, but I think it's really good um, that you are, you know, that you do prioritize this because that's the thing. Like the only way that we can really, as entrepreneurs, move our businesses forward is to be willing to learn new things and try new things. Otherwise, we'll exactly. just be doing the same things. And if we're if what we're doing is not moving us forward, then you know <laughs> we're not no, going to change that unless we just think just differently. The thing is, doing is just as important. And sometimes like, you forget that you need to stop and say, okay, regroup. What the hell is going on? What should I be focusing on? And I think that that's what, uh, that's what I, I needed. And, and that's why I would have needed like maybe four months before that. But hey. Hey. <laughs> it's all part of the learning process, isn't it? <laughs> so let me ask you this. What do you think is the most effective way to change the world? I think the most effective way to change the world is if we all did what we were good at or what we love to do. That It's just as simple as that. I think too many people in the world are doing things they hate. They hate going to work. They, they live for the next vacation. And like that's just sad because if all of us tapped into what we really love to do, then I then I think you can change the world. Nobody wants to change the world when, they do, when, what they're, doing, when they're doing something they hate. So just do something you love and everything else personally will just fall into place. I completely agree. I love that. Thank you so much, Sinchi. Tell us how Thank we can best Lord. stay in touch with you. Um, I'm available on Twitter at, at Sinch, um, X-I-N-C-H, uh, and on Facebook, but my Facebook's a mess right now, so let's just stick to Twitter. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. And where can we find the uh, or download the uh, uh, Watch Over Me app? We're available on the Google uh, Play Store and um, the Apple App Store. So just search Watch Over Me and you'll be able to find it. Fantastic. Thank you so much and you have a beautiful day. Thank you for having me. Thanks, folks, for listening to the Entrepreneurs for Change podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us reach more people with inspiring stories like this one by giving us a five-star rating in iTunes. If this podcast inspires you to join the movement of change-making entrepreneurs, we'd love to give you a jumpstart with our free Business Changemakers Toolkit, which you can download at www.entrepreneursforachange.com slash join. If you have a change maker in mind you'd love for us to interview, go to entrepreneursforachange.com slash suggest and tell us who and why. Finally, feel free to stop by facebook.com slash entrepreneursforachange to share your thoughts and say hello. 